Hello and welcome to a new look podcaster's guide to the conspiracy, now with 200% more merchandising potential. Yes, after a year of asking Josh to produce a brand new podcast icon, we finally gave them to Josh's legendary laziness. So very, very lazy. And spent the good monies of our fine patrons on new and exciting artwork. Mm, frankly, we're very pleased. Indeed we are. One James Wendelborn, aka Smug Liberal, is the designer of this new look for us, and it is swanktastic. Please don't use that word again. I will, and you cannot stop me, but I will bide my time. Mm. Anyway, we recommend you look at James's material over at smugliberalminority.com. There'll be a link in the podcast notes. And if we can get past my legendary laziness, we'll be setting up some kind of online storefront where you can get mugs and t-shirts and phone cases with the new art on it. And remember, if you don't buy a mug, Alex Jones wins. Mm. And now, the same old theme song as last week. Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Addison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello, you are listening to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. Or watching it on YouTube. Possible. Well, let's, let's hope, because mm. if you are, then you'll see both myself, Josh Addison, Dr. M. Denton. Uh, well, actually, we won't look any different, but the picture that will show up at the front will look different, because we've got new artwork. We have, and indeed, if you're listening to the podcast and you're using a podcast app, and if you're not using a podcast app, I'm not I am quite, quite sure curious. how you're doing it. Yeah. And you could actually listen to it on the Conspiracism page, but you'll still know mm. there is new artwork associated as logos, artwork, banners, the whole galore with our podcast because we have designed, well, we have, we have, we have commissioned mm. with, with feedback, we made suggestions, mm -hmm. we've commissioned new artwork designed by. James Wendelborn, mm. aka Smug Liberal, on Twitter. Yeah, so it wasn't not not entirely my towering laziness. There was also the fact that I'm not a graphic designer and a little bit rubbish at coming up with good ideas for logos. So we thought, True, let's get the professional rubbish at coming up with good ideas. Mm. Well, except it was my idea to hire a professional to do it for us, which cost us a large sum of money. Well, it's again a terrible idea by one Josh yes. Addison. Uh, but it was a large sum of money uh, from our patrons. Yes. So basically, and, thank yeah, you. And the reason why we commissioned the work, and we specifically when we commissioned the work on Twitter by putting a call out, said we were going to be paying for the artwork, is we do think that mm. artists deserve to be paid. Yes, none of this exposure nonsense. Which then takes us to the emotional blackmail part of this preamble to the podcast, because if you enjoy the podcast's Guide to the Conspiracy, Josh and I are artists of a kind. Of a kind. So you might like to think of putting a few dollars our way to help keep this podcast growing and also to allow us to do things such as commissioning artwork for the podcast and who knows, in future, commissioning new stings or songs. Indeed. Now, from shame, one, one kind of shameless self-promotion to another, I hear you've, you're in an encyclopedia I like that? am. So the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is put out by the University of Martin, which is in Texas, or is it the University of Texas, Martin? I can never quite get these American universities in mm. their name, location, jimble jamble, quite right. They've put out an entry on conspiracy theories, and I'm pleased to say that my work is referenced throughout. Ooh la la. Indeed, it's referenced throughout to the point where, at the end, where it has a list of recommended readings, my 2014 book, The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories, as published by Palgrave Macmillan, is recommended as one of the best texts to read to get up to date on the philosophy of conspiracy theories. Well, there you go. Acad academic recognition. Let's hope it brings me a job. That would be nice. It really would mm, be. Mm, jobs are good. Is so, this a thing called money? Yeah, they give you some of that stuff. And disposable income. I've never actually experienced these mm. things, but I would like to one day at least have a few weeks of it. Yes. But until that day, uh, we'll just keep recording episodes, I guess. Um, now we've... I, I think that's it for the shameless um, self-promotion. So instead, let's talk about a time when you were on the radio recently. Indeed. Just a... Mm. Everyday event in my life. Yeah. So, Josh, tell me about me being on the radio. Well, because I know nothing about mm. this. So, I saw an interesting. I, I actually read read the print version. Uh, radio New Zealand's website, rnz.co.nz. I guess it's a .co, isn't it? 
Actually, that's a good question. I just, sort of I just start typing R E Z and it, it fills it in up. But yeah, I think it is actually registered as a company mm. website as opposed to an org or... I mean, the same as tvnz.co.nz. They are kind yeah. of companies. It's hard to tell in this in this dystopian socialist nightmare that we live in where the government controls all and it's gives true. us free healthcare and what have you. But no, Radio New Zealand uh, has a website where, apart from being able to listen to their various shows and interviews and th- so on they put on, they also uh, have written articles about this stuff. And I happen to be reading such an article about people who'd been digging for giant's bones somewhere down in New Zealand. And who did I see referenced and indeed quoted in this article but one Dr. M. Dentith? And I thought, I know a Dr. M. Dentith. They're probably going to want to find this other M. Dentith and fight for the right to use their name. And... I did, which is why I'll be going to court next week for murder. Mm. Um, so we thought, since it's a, a relevant topic, why don't we talk about people hunting for giants and also positing conspiracy theories as for why we can't find giants. So in that way it's relevant to actually... This so episode. this is basically a rehash or recurrence, or to use a philosophical term, recudcent, which is the first time the term conspiracy theory turns up in the... Oxford English Dictionary is associated with the recudrance, I can't even pronounce the word properly, of a conspiracy theory. So it's an Weird. apt term mm. of the Celtic New Zealand thesis. It is. It all sort of ties into that. So, I mean, a bit of background. Pe- people, people have been talking about giants forever. Pretty much every culture has stories about people larger than regular humans who used to exist but don't anymore for some reason. Um... In the Bible, obviously, you've got your Goliaths and the the Nephilim are the ones who people like to talk about. The the who, what were they? They were like half angel or something, and they were supposedly all giants. And yes, depending on which version of Christian mm. eschatology you are looking at, yes, either the offspring of angels and humans, or they are the race of pre-human entities that existed before the deluge, where they lived along with humans, and then God wiped them out with a big flood, or other variations of the same. Yes, now, we could give, we could give sort of, you know, possibly more scientific explanations for these things. Occasionally, human beings have various growth disorders that cause them to grow to uh, fairly impressive heights. I think uh, Robert Wadlow, the American man who who's, has the record for being the, the, the tallest officially measured and verified human being, was almost nine feet tall and supposedly still growing when he died. Because it turns out that there are certain genetic disorders that basically don't turn off the growing process in mm. human beings. So it's entirely possible these sorts of things have been happening since, the, since the, as long as there were human beings. So that, that, that could certainly be an origin for some of these stories. but um, And there are people who, as ethnicities, are on average taller mm. than other ethnicities, which is usually due to dietary factors, mm. access or lack of access to particular types of food. Mm. But, um, but, but that's a bit too prosaic an explanation for some people. Often people will go out looking for um, giants specifically so that they can verify some theory about these ancient peoples that they had. So when it comes to the Bible, people will be looking for evidence of of the remains of these uh, giants that were in the Bible. I mean, Goliath, depending on who you, how you interpret the Bible, was his his height comes out at either nine foot something or seven foot something, which is entirely within the range of of human possibility. So people have been. People, people sort of go on hunts. Old, um, the first one I saw, old Cotton Mather, who was, he was a scientist who came up with lots of interesting stuff, but was also one of the key figures behind the Salem witch trials, for which he's mostly remembered. He was one of those scientists. Yes. Uh, he found some fossilized leg bones and teeth near New York in, in 1705. Reckon they must have been um, uh, remains of the Nephilim, although people these days think they're probably uh, mastodon bones. Indeed, actually, this seems to be a recurrent feature for a lot of the giant mythology we find in particularly the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, is the discovery of fossilized remains and people assuming that these must be relatively recent human bones of some particular kind, and it's only in retrospect when people go back to these original discoveries that they realize hmm, actually we're probably looking at the bones of extinct animals, which is why humans at the time didn't recognise them as such, and went, oh, this must be a really big version of X or Y, Mm. like a human being. Yes. 
Now moving it to a local context, um, there are there are stories, of course, um, in Maori and Polynesian culture of of large people, um, as we said, pretty much universal. Um, and so people here have been digging around uh, to look for for remains of these supposed giant folk. Perhaps we'll perhaps we'll leave the motivations till a little bit later to really get into exactly why people might want to. Josh doesn't want to use the word racism. Of, oh, I do. I just want to wait. I want to build up. I want to build up to it, um, and talk about just just what's been happening at the moment. So the, the um, RNZ article from last week by uh, Susan Strongman. Indeed. Is she a fan of Adventure Time? Because there is the character of Susan Strong in Adventure you Time. You know, I had not made that connection whatsoever. Oh, and if I had made that connection, I probably still wouldn't have asked her that when we were talking well, no, exactly. about, about giants hidden in caves down just, the country. Just wondering how often she gets that reference given to her. Um, but yes, she, she... Now, she came across this story independently of you... Is that yes, correct? But so, it's something you've been looking into for a while. So there is there is this blog called Tung, Tungata... Um, no, I've, I've just gone completely... Tangata Whenua. Mm -hmm. I, I got stuck there on the uh, sound. Speech disfluency is terrible, and one of the reasons why I particularly hate it is when trying to say people's names or pronouncing words that aren't in English, suddenly it sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about mm. or I don't know who I'm talking to. And that makes me feel embarrassed, which of course then amps up the anxiety of speech disfluency, that then means you just can't say a single word properly, mm. and then you just shrivel up and die, but that's another matter entirely. Yes. So there's this blog called tangatatafenua.com, and it was devoted to an investigation of apparently a cavern which would contain within it the remains of seven to eight foot tall pre-Maori people in the country of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, I came across this blog sometime back in 2017 and started following it, going, oh, this is, this is a bit weird. I actually can't remember how I came across it. I think someone may have mentioned it on Twitter, or it might have been one of those brief periods of time where I was trying really hard on social media to follow people of a variety of different political persuasions, something which I don't do anymore because it just makes me feel angry the entire time I use mm. social media. But I came across it, I started talking about it, and I also tried to make contact with the relevant authorities to find out what was going on with this unauth unauthorized dig, which was looking for human remains. Now, at some point halfway through last year, Susan Strongman came across the same blog. She got in contact with me. We had some conversation about the potential motivations and history of these particular beliefs. And then she got in contact very recently to say that she'd actually written a piece for RNZ that was going to be published at some point in the near future. And could I be interviewed for some sound bites, which then led to me being interviewed by Jesse Mulligan on the radio. So yes, I've been following the story for... Mm. Actually, almost three years now. Yep. So what are the details then? The, these guys, do they make their identities public on the blog? The impression I got was that they hadn't. No. So whenever they do reference each other, and I'm actually not even sure whether all the blog posts are written by the same person or by individuals within the collective, there appears to be quite a number of non-archaeologists, non I want to stress this here, these people who are engaging and tunneling into the earth have no archaeological training whatsoever. They always use initials to refer to right. each other. Although Susan has been able to track down the identity of some of them, given other details that have come out, and at least one of the ring leaders has named himself publicly. Uh, I think his name is, I want to say Rodney Dangerfield, and yet suddenly that I'm going... That doesn't sound right at all. No, that's, that's another guy. That sounds like a famous American comedian, but I actually think it might be this guy's name as well, because mm. I think he's the Reiki practitioner. We'll get oh, on to oh, him yeah. in we'll, just a We'll get a to Reiki eventually as well. Yes. So they are of the belief that somewhere near Huntley, there is a cavern containing within it the remains of several seven to eight foot tall human beings who predate the Maori, which was discovered by people and rumoured to exist about 20 years ago. And then the tunnel leading into this cavern was filled in to prevent anyone else from finding it. 
So they found what they thought was the covered in entryway to the tunnel and have been excavating this tunnel now for over two and a half years and have basically tunneled for about 14 meters underground to try to get to the burial place of these pre-Maori giants. And this dig is occurring on private land, so the actual tunnel entrance is apparently on a roadside, but the tunnel goes into nearby farmland. And on the blog, they intimated quite strongly that the owner of the land not only knew what they were doing, but strongly approved of what they were doing to prove that the real history of this place has been hidden away from the rest of us. Mm. Yes, because here is here is the conspiracy angle. It's not just that um, here's an interesting thing we found that that that, that um, a if true could revolutionise a bunch of stuff, but it's uh, the stuff that we're investigating has been deliberately hidden. Um, what's the what's the quote from the blog? Maori, as we know them, did not possess an empty land as taught in the school books these days or as printed these days in the media. Polynesians, greengrocers apostrophe, in fact came to a land already occupied and then they conquered it. What is inside our cave when we finally reach the cavern part will eventually prove this. So yes, they, they are very very deliberately seeking to upend history. Um, there was a and quote very somewhere deliberately else about it of the belief that the government and presumably Māori have been working together to hide that history from the rest of us. Mm. Now, where, where, where did they get these ideas in the first place? I heard something uh, in one of the articles about some road worker told them about it sometime or some guy heard it from another guy or something. It seemed a little bit um, shaky. So yes, there is a lot of the telephone game going on here. So the telephone game is the right title you should be using to the rather racistly named Chinese whispers. That's only a New Zealand-Australian thing, apparently. They really? don't call it that in overseas. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, telephone game is a very American term. Yeah, yeah. That's no, I've, I've, yeah. I've heard of Americans being horrified to hear that over here it gets called Chinese whispers. Well, in which... the same respect, Americans are horrified that we have a sweet hair called Eskimos. Well, yes, there's that as well. But that's... Yes, that's another thing entirely. It is. Uh, so yeah, there's been the story going around for a while, and it doesn't seem to be localised to any particular place, but people have heard of road workers who are doing work that digged up pre maori giant remains. Now you do have to ask how road workers know the remains they're digging up aren't, aren't Māori whatsoever. But the story goes they dig up these remains, they notify the Department of Conservation, and then the story is made to disappear, and thus people hear about it when they go down to the pub or they win a meat raffle or something of that particular kind. And there are a lot of these stories circulating. And all of these stories share in common that people in authority are trying to hide something from the rest of us. So there is a large-scale conspiracy operating at a departmental or governmental level to hide our true history. But these stories can never be made concrete. Well, they are urban legends, essentially, in mm. the same respect. You'll get the urban legend of a child playing in a sandpit that pricks itself on a sharp object, child falls sick, get sent to hospital and you discover that the child had a drug overdose because there's a heroin needle in the sandpit and yet it turns out the needle in the sandpit is never from your town it's from two towns down but when you try to track that down it's also from two towns down from there because there is no mm. originating story yeah now the 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 rnz story um includes a bunch more details about the background of these things susan strongman dug up in her own investigations, the various stories, or had she... Some of them are... Some of them from the blog. No, so some of them are stories which have been going around for a long time. Some of them are from interviews with people in the locality, and some of them are from blog posts on tang tangatafenua.com. Mm. So, yes, we have the story of Al Mannering, um, grew up on a, a nearby farm, um, recalls stories of um, a pofenua, a carved wooden post being found near where roadworks were being done, which he says, you know, that show, shows that there um, is evidence of uh, former Maori settlement or something like that, and claims he recalls seeing a human femur that was longer than his and he's six feet tall. I want to know how we can recognise that something is a human femur as opposed to a mower bone, or even just another bone in the human body. Is this man a serial killer who butchers victims and thus knows what a fe femur looks like? Is he a surgeon? 
I don't know. Is he a butcher? To be fair, the femur is the longest bone. So yes, but how do you know it's a human bone? Well, exactly, yes. So we have uh, now a story from 88-year-old Morris Tyson, um, who's lived in the area for a very long time, talks about a, a crypt filled with 14 or more eight-foot-tall skeletons, which were uncovered by road workers and then quickly reburied by archaeologists. Um, although he goes on to say he doesn't claim to have actually seen any of this or seen the, the being reburied or anything like that. He heard about it from the road workers. Um, now, human bodies in caves is not an unusual phenomena in this country because a lot of, well, I say a lot of, the disposal of bodies in certain iwi in Aotearoa, particularly pre colonization by the Europeans, was putting bodies in caves. And it is also quite possible in a situation where a body has been left in a cave and the flesh and sinew has basically rotted away. The assemblage is going to look a lot larger because it's no longer being connected by mm. ligaments. So stretched out or fallen apart, bodies will look a lot taller than they would be when they're kind of compressed into a muscular frame. Mm. So it's quite possible to see bodies in a cave and think they look taller than they actually are because most of us don't ever encounter skeletons. And when we do see skeletons in TVs and movies... Generally wired together. Yes, precisely. Mm. Mm. To, to give the proper proportions of a human body. Um, now, I, the, the, one, the one thing that sort of came up at the top of, of most of these stories is that these guys have been digging for a few years now um, and claim to have found a bone, um, which they claimed was a... They said there was a femur, did they? A human bone, anyway, which they claimed was much uh, was a partial bone, but extrapolating out to its full size meant it was much larger than a bone uh, of that kind should have been. Uh, people who have looked at at least photos of this bone uh, reckon it is a moa bone. The moa, for any uh, of our non-New Zealand listeners, uh, might not know, uh, New Zealand was home to a bunch of um, giant flightless birds and one giant and very, one giant very eagle. flighty bird. Yes, the, the biggest eagle. eagle the world has ever seen. Mm. Uh, eight sheep, apparently. And there is some there is some reason to think because the, the Hast eagle actually died out somewhere about a thousand years ago. But it's suspected, given certain Maori legends, that it must have been alive for a certain period of time after the initial wave of Polynesian mm. colonization. Because there are stories of children being snatched from their cribs by giant birds. Yes. And this bird is of the size that a baby would be the perfect mm. snack for it. It certainly would. Uh, but yes, apart from the house eagle, we had the moa, which uh, the, the, the largest of them were what? like nine feet tall, even yeah, more, yeah. even so more giant, giant, giant flightless bit, yeah. birds, which naturally had very, very large leg bones. Um, so, And were preyed upon by Kia. Did, were they? Did yeah, they, so... Was well, it like really, those little fish that just bite chunks out of a whale and swim off? Yes, but as parrots. But as parrots. But, so Kia are these incredibly intelligent parrots that we have here that prior to European colonisation used to move as giant flocks across the the countryside and they have a penchant for the liver of sheep so basically farmers don't like kia because kia will grab onto the side of a sheep locate its liver by smell and using its really really interesting beak bite into the liver eat the liver which then leads to the sheep dying mm. turns out a lot of moa remains we've found died because their livers have been eaten. Huh, how about that? And so it seems that the thing that made Kia go, oh, sheep livers taste great, is a predisposition to eating livers generally, and their previous supply of livers, which died out a long time ago, has been replaced by sheep instead. Mm, well, how about that? Very clever birds. Anyway, enough of enough of ancient fauna of our country. Um, Although we should, it is. I mean, if you want more about that, we can do a, a podcast special. Mm, yes, no, it is. It is a fascinating subject. So, what 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 happened then? You you the story went up. You got interviewed. Uh, then there was an update of the story, which said that um, among other things, this claim that uh, the farmer whose land they were digging under was supportive of them, turned out to be not so much true as... As hogwash. Completely untrue, yeah. And so the farmer apparently was livid to discover that these people had been digging around underneath his land. So suppose the dig has now been called off? 
Is that the... Yes, although here's where the story gets interesting. Mm. So the last update on the blog about the dig, it was back in November. And in November, they were talking about how they'd got to a particular part of the tunnel. Now, I want to point out here, I don't think they're excavating a tunnel. I think it's very likely they're excavating the remains of a waterway, which has filled up over time, which is why they're finding something which is a tunnel-like structure, but it's because water used to flow mm. through it, and it stopped, and it's just kind of filled up with debris over time. As they've been digging through, they encountered an incredibly large boulder in the structure, which meant if they continued to dig forward, there was a very large likelihood of a collapse of a giant stone structure that if it struck someone would actually kill them, which to my mind kind of suggests it's not a tunnel at this particular mm. point, it's something else entirely. So they're now going, oh, actually the dig was basically at an end before Susan wrote the story in question because this structure was going to be too hard for us to get around. Now, there's nothing in the November update that indicates they're going to give up. I think they're trying to go the, no, we haven't been owned, you've been owned type mm. of response there. Right. So that's, that's kind of where it stands. You got a, you got a few um, interesting contacts as a result of your raised profile. Yes, so we're going to go through a Twitter conversation I had in just a minute. Although, end of last week... I received a message from the University of Waikato, where I currently work, saying, this person has tried to get in contact with you, could you please ring them back? I assume they were a student who wanted to know something about enrollment or assessment in a course I'm about to teach. It turned out it was a member of the public who wanted to tell me about how it was terrible that I was describing these conspiracy theories about a prehistory as conspiracy theories, to try to explain, I don't use the word in a pejorative sense, but he really wasn't listening to anything mm. I said, and then proceeded to claim he wasn't a racist whilst engaging in a lot of racist speech. Lovely. And that was 20 minutes of my life I'm not getting back. Mm. But yes, on Twitter, we had a, uh, well, I had an interesting exchange, and Josh, we're going to, we're going to do a bit of role playing here. I'm going to get you to play the person who is questioning the official narrative, and I'm going to play myself. Because so, I need to get the intonations right about the way that I was responding to these claims. So, so here in is... Sure we, we, so there's no possibility that I could be you, and you could be the abusive asshole dick? No. Okay. No. So, the Fine. podcaster's guide to the conspiracy Players are now going to produce a short play, Someone Has an Irritating Conversation with M. The scene is a computer screen, two people typing to each other. Well, uh, sorry, before we start, what was the background to this? The first post this guy references Susan, so was he replying to one of Susan Strongman's tweets about so, the yes, article? So he was replying to her posting about the article online. Right. -o. <clears throat> it begins... And this is a canoe prowl, right, Susan? You're a complete... You're spelled Y-O-U-R. A complete sellout shill for a communist government. Please do shut your face hole. And there then follows a photograph of a carved piece of wood, uh, which kind of looks like a canoe prowl, but could and be I, something else, maybe. We'll, you, we'll, in yeah, the video version, yeah. we'll put it up yeah. on screen. Yeah. And you think it's what exactly? Well, what do you think it is? You're the one disputing its provenance, so really you're the one who has to provide an alternative explanation. What do you think it is, and how does it relate to talk of eight-foot giants in our prehistory? Okay, done. Why should I answer your questions? I guess because you're accusing people of being in on a communist plot, because you're telling journalists not to report stories, which is why I'd like to know what you think that object is. But if you're not willing to support your assertion with... Uh, argument, and here I miss out the word, and evidence, mm. so I just say, argument, evidence, so be it. Now at this point, uh, M's interlocutor gets a bit sweary, and kind of stays a bit sweary, so if you don't like um, uh, strong language, maybe skip ahead a few minutes on the podcast. Because he continues, look at the fucking thing, you muppet, you really are a troll, huh? Are you a baby eater too? Obviously. If I came across you in a dark alley, I think I would drop to my knees and pray. It's the tuning end. Okay, now we get to the actual claim. It's the tuning end of a stringed instrument and much larger than normal. Satisfied, you freak? So are all similar similar decorative prowls of Polynesian vessels 
also the tuning end of the string instrument, or is this the only one? Which ones, where I see nothing? There are not only these things called museums, which display similar objects, there are also books on Polynesian bo- I, damn, oh dear man, Polynesian You're book building. Mm. Polynesian Boats. boat building is what I meant to say, mm. and design. Modern examples. It's not as if people stopped building boats, etc. Are you real? What are you talking about? You aren't making any sense, so therefore why should I listen to you? Prove that there is something they have compared it to. Prove to me that I am wrong. All I see is gibberish. Which is normally spelled with a G, isn't it? It spells it with a J. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Here's a paper showing the wonderful variety of such browse. I provide a link. So there's one point of data for you. A cursory search online will find you quite a lot more such examples. And oh look, none of them are as small as this one, and none of them even look the same. Must have been the outrigger prowl then. What are you trying to do here? Best shut up and save face. Oh yeah, you obviously can't shut it by the looks of that face. I mean, in your, in your photo, you do appear to be talking, which I guess the inference is that you never ever stop talking. It's true, I ever. don't. I guess maybe that makes sense. Do you think the prowls of English ships at the time look the same? The thing about decorative items is they all tend to look different. Are you still... Sorry. Are you still here? I, I actually got distracted by the fact that he spelt the word wrong. <laughs> that sentence suddenly made no sense to me, but what I think he was saying was, Are you still here distracting me and wasting my time so I can't spread the word? Dork, get off, you are embarrassing yourself. Shame you aren't interested in discussing evidence, but as you don't want to get to the nub of the issue, I won't bother you any further. Although, maybe you shouldn't have included me in your original tweet if you don't want to be challenged over your claims. What's to talk about? Facts don't care about your feelings, mate. I thought you didn't want to continue this con conversation. I will waste your time more than you will waste my time. I love talking to morons. Makes me hard, charming. I bet you love that. Tell me, who other than you thinks the object in question is part of a stringed instrument? Is there a body of work which attests to this? Who are the experts who opine that it is what you say it is? Why are you so worried about what I have to say anyway? I have had an expert look at it and thinks it is definitely strange they call it a canoe prowl. I am gifted, so don't need a so-called professional to make my decisions for me, and no, I won't tell you who is, that's my business. You're the Probably one comes from Canada. You're the one accusing people of communist plots. Then there's a link to the website kilts.co.nz. I assume it's not a website specifically about kilts? No, it's a website about ancient Celtic New Zealand. Funny that. I am aware of that site. I'm also aware that its claims are not just disputed, but they're also not well supported by the oral histories and archaeology both here and abroad. Pray, what kind of sailing vessels were these purported Scots using to get here nearly a thousand years ago? Better ones than a bloody canoe or something made of reeds. Show me some evidence that disputes this. Even the basic Wikipedia article on Polynesian navigation shows just how sophisticated their navigational technology was. Then there are the accounts made by Europeans at first contact with Polynesian peoples. Basic research, and I then provide a link to Pol Polynesian boat technology. But yet a people with better tech couldn't do it right? Dork, why are you even bothering? You are living the lie they tell you. Do not trust your government. And now things get explicitly conspiratorial. They have lied to you for centuries and continuing to blindly believe is what is wrong with this planet. Yeah, the they, planet they... is all in capitals except for the T. He must have got his finger off the shift key too soon. The Europeans did not have better aqua technology. People who study this point out that up until the European age of exploration, the Polynesians were better at traversing oceans. It's not plausible Europeans could have got here before the Maori with their technology at the time. I asked for proof, not hearsay. Do shut you dick hole. So Pear? shut your... Uh, it yeah. doesn't matter. Not I don't worth... know, I mean, it could be that do shut you... Do shut oh, do you, do shut. Di yeah, you dick hole. Possibly. Okay. Peer-reviewed research is more than just hearsay. More say, more say than, uh, I, I think more so is what I meant Probably. right there, than relying upon anonymous experts. Where? I see nothing. Persians made it to South America and then here. Why are you wasting your time trying to convince someone that will never listen to you? Are you a bot? I suspect you are trying to get blocked. I don't block idiots. They deserve to hear the truth. Where are the Persian city complexes in the Americas? Where are the inscriptions? Who translated them? These claims have all been carefully analysed in the past and found wanting. Also, you are the one who continued this conversation. DNA evidence suggests otherwise, mate. Where is all your proof? All I see is rubbish drivel. Carry on, mate. I am here all day. If the DNA evidence suggests this, where's the linguistic evidence? You would expect Persian words and phrases to have integrated into the language groups these Persians apparently interbred into. Where's that evidence? 
And I suspect you're mistaking population genetics with evidence of pre-contact. Given global populations, we'll find evidence of people with ancestry from all over the place. The only reliable DNA you could furnish here is pre-contact bodies with Persian DNA. Where are those studies? Blah blah blah, where is your studies? You obviously don't look in the places that really matter. Stop reading and replying to me and go do some homework. You just seem to be repeating claims made by Max Hill and Gary Cook. I'm afraid. I tend to rely on experts and their work rather than that of amateur historians. I've read their material, along with Dutre, Brailsford and the like. It's not very convincing. Who are they? They are the major names in this country who promote the claims you are making. Have you not even done your own homework to see who else believes the stuff you do? And uh, the record ends there. So that was the last... His no, it, they actually, there, you there, there was a little bit more and then I got blocked. Right, yeah. After saying he wasn't going to block you, yeah. and after saying he was quite happy to keep talking to you and wasting it. Anyway, I, I begin to suspect that this person was not a good faith interlocutor. No. no. In fact, having discovered this person on Facebook, they are also of the belief that Freemasons not only control the world, are engaging in satanic, paedophilic sacrifices on a day-by-day -day basis in this country, but they also control the evening breeze. Nice. No, apparently not. The Bruce oh. actually set out to destroy this person's life by annoying them at evening time. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Can't fault the logic. Yes, you can. Oh. Well, I mean, I could. I just can't be bothered because... Fair enough. Mm. Um, so, but, I mean, this, this sort of gets us... Let, let's finish things off with um, the, 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 the talk of motive, basically, because there is nothing inherently wrong with believing that giant races existed or looking for evidence to prove this theory. Just, just by itself like that, but um, in practice, when people go looking for evidence of, of other races, giant or otherwise, especially in this neck of the woods, it's usually to further some sort of a political agenda. Indeed, and that agenda tends to be both the claim that Maori civilization can't have been as complex as people make it out to be, because they're brown savages, and also, if we can show that white people got to this country first, then the Treaty of Waitangi is null and void because reasons. Mm. Yes, I mean, it's sort of a, another extension of the whole Moriori thing. That, that used to be the stock claim that, like, you know, uh, European colonizers came and stole all the Maori's land. Well, the Maori only stole their land off the Moriori, so turnabout's fair yeah. play. Nothing so to complain about. I should point out for non-New Zealand mm. listeners, the Moriori are... And I have to be very careful here about talking about the Moriori because they have their own particular mythology and whakapapa. But they are a group of people who were living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, contemporaneously with the Maori, most mainland New Zealand scholars believe that the Māori Ori are simply just another iwi of the Ma Māori whose culture developed in isolation on Rikohu or the Chatham Islands. They certainly aren't as was taught in schools in the early part of the 20th century, a pre-Māori Melanesian people who were chased out of these lands by the Māori when they arrived. And yet somehow, despite the fact that this bad history, which made it into the European history books, but not the oral traditions of the Māori, continues to resonate to this day, despite the fact that the Māori are going, no, we are not these pre-Melanesian people that you claim we are. Also, P.S. we're not extinct, which is well, one yeah, of that's, the other yeah, that's the, yes. that's the other thing. They're able to go, we're not, because mm. they still exist. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was sort of a... but but sort of uh, historical education does appear to be furthering. And there was a, just recently, there was an official governmental recognition. Yes, in fact, I think it was actually last it week. It was just, just really oh, recently, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's becoming harder to lean on that one, but that's okay. You can go back to all the other ancient civilizations that supposedly were here before the Maori and who therefore were the real original inhabitants of now, this country and so on and so forth. The Treaty of Waitangi thing here is interesting because... We have a treaty between the Crown and Ma Māori, which was basically a power-sharing arrangement made when the Europeans started coming here in number, and Ma Māori became concerned about what was going on here, and the Crown was going, we need to kind of solidify our power base here. 
Now the treaty itself is quite contentious because there's an English translation and there's a Te Reo Māori version of the text. They differ in some quite significant ways around key terms and there's a lot of debate as to how we should interpret those differences. But what's important about this, the treaty is not a treaty between the indigenous people of this place and the crown. It is a treaty between Māori as a people and Pākehā as a people, which means that even if it did turn out there was a civilization here before the Māori arrived, it wouldn't actually make the treaty null and void, because it's not a treaty between the first people and the crown. It's a treaty between one people and another people, and nothing rests upon the claim of who was here first. Mm. So there you go. So, one last detail uh, that we teased at the beginning of this episode. Reiki, uh, one of the one of the these tunnel diggers, is apparently a Reiki practitioner and has placed a curse on it just to keep it safe. Which is interesting that obviously they don't place any stock in Maori notions of tapu, which would certainly apply if this was the resting place of um, of other people. But they are they are fully on board with Reiki. Now, I did refer to this Reiki practitioner as Rodney Dangerfield. That was incorrect. He is Rodney Davidson. Davidson. But it's there close enough to That's Dangerfield close. that I feel that I could have got away with that in a court of law. Mm. So there you have it. Basically, um, people were looking for giant bones, found what was probably a mower bone. They've stopped digging now anyway. M talked about it on the radio. Indeed. Just mm. another day in the life of me as a conspiracy theory theorist. Mm. Fascinating stuff. So, I think we're at the end of an episode. Um, so, uh, once again, hope you enjoy the swanky new graphics. They're swanktastic. Mm. At the very least, they should show up as the, the um, icon on your podcast reader. But if you happen to look at the video episode, it'll also show up, I guess, for about 15 seconds on the on the start of it. But it looks very good, and we're very proud of it. Yeah, it's on all yeah. our websites and stuff for the, for the and podcast. And there may well be merchant. And it's very cool. Yes, no, we have yeah. to get our hands on some merch. Mugs, phone cases, maps. Tea towels seem to be a thing these days. Oh, actually, we're, that's, nothing, nothing quite like cleaning your aubergine with a tea, tea towel with the podcaster's guide mm. to the conspiracy on it. So we'll have to investigate that. But um, until then, uh, we will leave you alone, but not you, the patrons who've paid for this graphical rebrand, because we have a, a patron bonus episode coming up where we talk about well, stuff, we, yeah. local stuff, election stuff. We've got donation scandals in this country. We've got a claim by George Soros about a conspiracy, not a claim of about George Soros about a conspiracy. And we've got two bits of very interesting mm. Trump-related news, one involving Julian Assange and the other one involving any of the show, Roger Stone. Mm. Mm. Still got the Richard Nixon tattoo? I think once you've got that tattoo, it's indelibly marked into your soul, so yes. Yeah, okie doke. Well, so if you're interested in that, stick around. If you're a patron, if you're not a patron, why not become a patron? Patron, patron, patron. You're just going to keep saying the word patron until every one of you is a patron. In fact, actually, let's just chant patron and we'll just fade out on patron, 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 if patron, you think that patron, would work. patron, 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 don't know about patron, you, but when I'm editing the video, I will have cut along before this point. Patron. Patron. You've been listening to the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, starring Josh Addison and Dr. M. R. X. Dented, which is written, researched, recorded, and produced by Josh and M. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its Podbean or Patreon campaigns. And if you need to get in contact with either Josh or M, you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their Twitter account, Monkey Fluids and Conspiracism.
And remember, it's just a step to the left.